you ever just had one of those days where you feel like the space-time continuum is just out of sync, maybe things are moving a little bit too fast for you, maybe you're feeling a bit out of control, and perhaps you're feeling as if you need some help with accountability and with just self-improvement overall. Well, you know what? I have something for just that sort of a day. I'd like to invite you to join me on my brand new, completely free coaching database. That's right, you can access the entire database forever for free. Your data is encrypted and protected. And the best part about this is that while you use the services for free and help to keep yourself accountable in your own space that I've created for you, I use it myself and I swear by it. You can also, if you'd like, add on both a la carte and or subscription coaching services. Whether you're looking for help with image consulting, fashion buying, fashion consulting, whether you're looking for relationship coaching, executive coaching, whether you're looking for something more along the lines of professional or team building type of coaching, maybe you're just struggling and you need some help with accountability. Maybe you've got a relationship that you'd like to improve or you'd like to improve your ability to communicate in your personal or work life. Whatever the issue is, I've got you. And in addition to that, I also offer coaching services only. I'm not going to ask you to buy any kind of a goofy product or anything like that. But I do offer simple coaching services and solutions to help folks to improve their credit, to help folks to invest. It doesn't matter whether you think you have the money or not, I will find it for you and we will get you started on an awesome retirement savings, life building, family savings, and or investment regimen. That service is something that many of my clients choose to take part in in addition to whatever other coaching and wellness services they feel they need. So please come on by our brand new database on the Nudge Coach platform. I will see you there. Hey folks, welcome back to Dominique Does Life. It's your girl Dominique back here with you. If you weren't already aware, you can catch me on Facebook Live uh, at Dominique Does Life on Facebook. So I explained the situation to everybody there. I'd like for you guys to go over to Facebook.com and then uh, enter in Dominique Does Life where you can hear my message uh, that I just gave everybody at the beginning of the show while you guys were listening to the commercial. Uh, now we're going to go right back to logical fallacies and folks who are not watching in on video, if you hear a pause, it's me drinking my coffee because it's getting to be that time. Uh, everybody needs that evening pick me up, right? And uh, side note, for those of you who are watching me, chocolate chicken, go there. It's an awesome little business in Door County, Wisconsin, one of my favorite places to go. Uh, in addition to Florida, the Keys, St. Pete Beach, Captiva, Sanibel, like those are my favorite places basically to go. And Chocolate Chicken does amazing coffee and they do amazing little snacks and cute little mugs like this. So go check it out. Now back to logical fallacies, we're gonna start today uh, we've been, again, we've been having this discussion for a while, and I appreciate everyone sticking with me so very much. Seriously, shout out to everybody who's been with me uh, from the beginning. If you haven't yet checked out the very first few episodes that I do of Logical Fallacies, you can find them on Spreaker.com at Dominique Does Life. Or you can, <clears throat> you can find them on the free Spreaker app at Dominique Does Life. So, back to logical fallacies. Today we're picking up with F-A through H-Y. And again, for those of you who are tuning back in or who have just tuned in for the first time, we are actually going by Dr. Bo Bennett's logicallyfallacious.com. I do highly encourage you to check out Dr. Bennett's website, and I'd love for you guys to check out his book, Logically Fallacious. It's an excellent book, and as I've said numerous times now, 
I just love the way he breaks everything down into just really specific categories. And while he breaks down specific um, sort of delineations of a broader umbrella category of logical fallacy, he doesn't get nitpicky about it. He just, he's logical about it. And obviously that's what we're here to accomplish anyway, um, teaching people about logical fallacies and helping people to, you know, continue to be their best selves and be able to put an argument together well. Now I am, excuse me, I'm really quickly here going to share this out on social media. There's just no real easy way to kind of talk and do this at one time. So I apologize. Look, you guys know me. I'm not trying to be covert about it. I'm, I'm just, I'm just doing it. I'm just going to be like, you know what? I got a social media share break, guys. Hey, this is what I'm doing. All right. <laughs> like it or lump it. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sharing everything out on social media right now before we really get started and get into things. And I'm going to go ahead and create a poll, I believe, as well. Uh, you guys let me know what, um, you know, weigh in and let me know what you think. What are your answers to the poll questions? What? Okay, let's... What um, situations spring to mind for you when you think of logical fallacy? Family arguments. <laughs> hmm. Family arguments. Politics. Now, I wish you could do two, uh, more than two answers. Can you now? Yes, you can. Yay. Family arguments, politics, workplace relations. Take this poll on uh, Facebook.com at Dominique Does Life. Workplace, uh, so, so the answers are to the question, what situations spring to mind for you when you think of logical fallacies? First option is family arguments. Second is po uh, po yeah, politics. Third is workplace relations. Fourth is, oh, fourth is my eyes are burning from allergies. Fourth is, um, my shirt hanger is sticking out of my shirt is what fourth is. Good grief, man. Get it together, lady. What are you doing? Get it together. So let's see. Fourth is, um, ba -ba 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 -ba. I'm going to say... Dating relationships. That should be juicy. And I'm going to tell you guys to comment below what specific situations y'all have been in personally, at work, with family, with a dating partner, where you have noticed that there's logical fallacy being thrown around when there's an argument, disagreement, or discussion. And by the way, folks, when I use the word argument, I'm speaking from a philosophical standpoint, so I'm not necessarily referring to like a heated, upsetting debate. I'm just talking about like, ha you know, having a discussion, weighing different sides of an argument, right? So anyhow, the first logical fallacy of today is uh, after pause for obligatory net crack, like usual, is false conversion. This one was one I was really looking forward to doing, and it's also known as illicit conversion or illicit inductive conversion. So I really like that Dr. Bennett weighs in right off the bat with new terminology. This is a category he doesn't use in many of his logical fallacy breakdowns, but I like it. New terminology, says Dr. Bennett. Type A logical forms, a proposition or premise that uses the word all or every. We've talked about this a lot before and I was super waiting for this one. So I'm excited, I hope you are too. So. Uh, proposition or premise that uses the word all or every. Type E, logical forms, a 
proposition or premise that uses the word none or no, e.g. no P or Q, and the all or every would be all P or Q. And then type I, logical forms, according to Dr. Bennett, uh, are propositions or premises that use the word some, e.g. some P or Q. Now stick with me, we'll break this down even further. If you're confused, don't worry. Um, we'll get into this, we'll parse it out. And then type O of the logical forms is the kitty cat fallacy. We've got a cute little invader here, a cute little peb cat. Here, Pebby. Well, you know what? We gotta put the footrest up for Pebby. Um, for those of you, real quick here, for those of you who don't know, Pebbles is my little, oh my gosh, she jumped down, my little kitty who unfortunately has cancer, so I'm choosing to spoil her, give her some extra love, and basically be her slave and do anything she wants, so sorry, but we're going to interrupt the podcast for kitties. That's just how, how I roll, especially with my pebcat around. Get it? Pebcat? Like pebcat? So, let's go through that again. The new terminology is type A, type E, type I, or type O. Type A is all people that use the proposition or premise uh, dependent on the word all or every. Type E, the logical form would be a proposition or premise that uses the word none or no. Type I, logical forms would be a premise or proposition that uses the word some. Type O logical forms would be a proposition or premise that uses the term some slash not. So some P are not Q. Some X are not I. Right? Some A are not B. Do you feel me on that? Description of the false conversion fallacy. The formal fallacy where the subject and the predicate terms of the proposition are switched around. They're converted. In the conclusion, in a, prop, uh, in a proposition that uses all in its premise, type, that's the type A form, all or every, or the type O form of some or not. So the logical form, uh, putting it out just like a simple algebraic equation would be line number one, all P R Q, not R Q, A R E Q, all P A R E Q. Therefore all Q R P. And then the second part of the equation, essentially line two, some P are not Q, therefore some Q are not P. And the first example via <clears throat> Dr. Bennett's website is all Hollywood Squares contestants are bad actors, therefore all bad actors are Hollywood Squares contestants. His second example, and this just so, it sounds a lot more complicated and convoluted in the description than it really is in practice, but it, false conversion is really, really important to think about and to realize because it's so common to, to understand it really is to elevate your own philosophical consciousness, as it were. So, example two. Some people in the film industry do not win Oscars. Therefore, some Oscar winners are not people in the film industry. Do you see how um, they're converting the proposition and the subject based on a conclusion that's simply not true? Like some people in the film industry do not win Oscars. Therefore, some Oscar winners are not people in the film industry. Not true. They're just saying that all people in the film industry are in the film industry, right? We can agree on that, I think. 
So all people in the film industry are people in the film industry. Some of them don't win Oscars. The correct form of that problem would be, therefore, not everyone in the film industry wins an Oscar. That would be the correct form. Not everyone in the film industry wins an Oscar. The explanation via Dr. Bennett's website is that it does not follow logically just because all Hollywood Squares contestants are bad actors. That all bad actors actually make it to Hollywood Squares. Same form problem with the second example. But, as you might have noticed, in the second example about film industry and Oscars, Dr. Bennett utilizes the terms some and are not, right? Instead of all, it's some and are not. All are in example one, right? And then in example two, some are not. So, one more time. Example one, all and are. Example two, some and are not. They're basically um, flip sides of the same expression. So positive and negative. All are, some are not. All are, some are not. I hope that makes sense to you. So, the exception to this rule would be none which is why I'm really excited about this logical fallacy. No exceptions to this rule. But to remember that type E and type I forms of this fallacy can use conversion and remain valid. So the example there is no teachers are psychos. Therefore, no psychos are teachers. Well, that's true. If that were actually scientifically proven, uh, that no teachers are uh, psychos or, I don't know, psychopaths, then yeah, no psychos or psychopaths would be teachers. It would follow, right? It follows. And then moving on from false conversion to the false dilemma. If our page ever loads, it'd be really great if it did. Ba 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 ba. Ba 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 ba. Okay, this is really, really fantastic. Okay, great. Anywho, we've loaded. False dilemma, also known as the all or nothing fallacy or the false dichotomy or an either or fallacy. Um, black and white thinking, uh, the fallacy of exhaustive hypotheses, if you want to be fancy about it bifurcation if you want to be super duper fancy about it excluded middle no middle ground or polarization if you want to explain it simply so this is a false dilemma fallacy the description via dr bennett's website is when only two choices are present uh, excuse me, presented, when only two choices are presented to, by the person making the argument, yet more choices actually exist, or a spectrum of possible choices exists between two extremes. False dilemmas are usually characterized by either this or that language, but can also be characterized by omissions of choices. Another variety is a false trilemma, which is when three choices are presented, when more actually exist. So you're only presenting, let's say, two choices. Let's say, okay, uh, and, and I've actually heard people say things like this, so it's not that far-fetched to use this as an example. You guys, there is a spider on my ceiling right now, and as you may know from hearing me talk on the air before, I have arachnophobia, so please excuse my constant upward gazes. I'm just hoping that sucker does not land right on my face. Ah, it just dropped off the ceiling. Oh my god, you guys. I, I might die. If anybody doesn't hear from me and sees this video, it, uh, this spider got me. Key. Sorry. Apologies. It's, it's a real thing for me. Ah, ah. Okay, well, what I was going to say is the, the false dilemma 
fallacy is, okay, I've, I've actually heard people use this example. Um, oh, yeah, spiders, holy cow. Keep it together. False dilemma fallacy is when, uh, a good example of it rather, is when somebody says, you're, let's say look back to the 2016 election. And I've, I've literally heard people say things like this. So you either vote for Hillary Clinton or you're basically voting for Hitler. It's like, well, not necessarily. I mean, there are definitely other candidates you could vote for, or God forbid, you could choose not to vote at all. So you're only presenting like two options, uh, very polarized options on two opposite ends of a spectrum when there are actually more choices to be had in between those two opposite ends of the spectrum, those two choices at the opposite ends of the spectrum. And... <clears throat> And the interesting thing that I find that plays in to the false dilemma uh, fallacy is that oftentimes uh, inaccurate facts are actually presented by the people making the argument. So, uh, you know, in, in inaccurate conclusions are being drawn, let's say inaccurate facts are being presented and the facts that are presented are overly simplified and as I mentioned at two opposite ends of the spectrum so that's what the false dilemma is so tell me if you guys have ever heard anybody use that false dilemma fallacy I'm keeping it together I'm just keeping an eye on the spider okay don't judge me <sighs> yes. Logical forms of the false dilemma fallacy are either X or Y is true. That's line one. Line two is either X, Y, or Z is true. Okay. So example with two choices rather than three via Dr. Bennett's website. You are either with God or against him. Well, not necessarily true, right? You could be agnostic. You could just be undecided. Or you just might not believe in God at all, but you're not against him, right? So it, it's a false dichotomy being presented. The explanation here via Dr. Bennett is, as Obi-Wan Kenobi so eloquently puts it in Star Wars Episode 3. Really, dude? Why Episode 3? Why are you trying to quote Episode 3? Mm, bruh. Anywho. As Obi-Wan Kenobi so eloquently apparently puts it in Star Wars Episode 3, only a Sith deals in absolutes. There are also those who simply don't believe there is a God, like I mentioned, to be either with or against. Or, again, as I mentioned, and this is just me adding this in, or potentially um, you're just somebody who hasn't made your mind up. You don't know if you think God exists or not. So really, that would be a false dichotomy. And... Uh, an example of omission would be, I thought you were a good person, but you weren't at church today. Or let's say, I thought you were a good person, but I found out that you were a vegan. I thought you were a good person, but then I found out that you had SEX. That's like, you know, that's, that's totally false. That's a completely false dichotomy. It's not an either or proposition. You can actually have both things be true and like still be a good person good people don't actually have to go to church every sunday right so the explanation that dr bennett offers uh, for that is that the assumption is that if one doesn't attend church that they must be horrible people of course good people do exist who don't go to church and good church going people could have had a really good reason not to be in church um Honestly, yeah, like what somebody might have had surgery, somebody might have passed away, you might be on your deathbed, I don't know. Um, 
there are lots of good reasons not to go to church, even if you're Christian, every Sunday. The exception to that rule would be that there may be cases when the number of options really is very limited. For example, if an ice cream man just has chocolate and vanilla left, it would be a waste of time insisting that he has mint chocolate chip or saying, hey, I want cherry, <laughs> whatever other flavor you can think of. Hey, I want butterscotch. No, I've only got chocolate or vanilla left. Pick one. Uh, it is also not a fallacy if other options exist, but you are not offering other options as a possibility. For example, Mom and Billy are having a discussion. Mom says, Billy, it's time for bed. Billy says, can I stay up and watch a movie? Mom, you can either go to bed or stay up for another 30 minutes and read. Billy, that's a false dilemma. Mom, no, it's not. Here, read Bo's book and you will see why. Billy, this is freaky. Our exact conversation is used as an example in this book. Love it. The tip here is be conscious of how many times you are presented with false dilemmas and how many times you present yourself with false dilemmas. I really like that. I appreciate that tip because oftentimes we do uh, internalize false dilemmas and we don't look at things critically but we look at things more from a standpoint of what our feelings are and uh, what our emotions are and what our reactive mind is saying. If anybody's paying attention to what happened with the spider, I have lost track of it. So I am freaking out a little bit, but I will hold it together the best that I possibly can. And yeah, I'm only half joking. I really genuinely have like a horror of spiders. It's a serious, but also kind of funny issue. Bleh. And people have made fun of me for it my entire life. But I digress. <sighs> Nobody cares about your arachnophobia, Dom. So the next uh, fallacy that we're going to be looking at is the false effect fallacy. Or non causa pro causa. The description of the false effect fallacy is unlike the false cause, which we did discuss uh, previously, unlike the false cause, the false effect incorrectly assumes an effect from a cause. Okay. And so it's the effect <clears throat> that's been incorrectly arrived at um, rather than a false cause being set out right off the bat. So, the logical form here would be a line one. X apparently causes Y. Line two, Y is wrong. Line three, therefore X is wrong. And then there's another example of the same problem. Line one, X apparently causes Y. Y is right. Therefore, X is right. And example number one says, watching TV that close will make you go blind. So move back. The explanation there via Dr. Bennett. The false effect from watching TV too closely is going blind. For the most part, the threat that you will ruin your eyesight is an old wives' tale, but it does have some credibility based on modern studies. But almost certainly nobody is going to go blind simply by virtue of sitting too close to the TV unless they ram their eyes into the protruding knobs. Well, that could definitely blind you. Anyway, the conclusion, says Dr. Bennett, is move back. But it's not warranted. It's a false effect. Example number two that Dr. Bennett gives of the false effect fallacy in action is giving 10% of your income to the church will free a child's soul from limbo into heaven. So give your money. Eek, by the way, that is creepy. Uh, the explanation. Centuries ago, the church stopped accepting bribes to get loved ones out of limbo. Wow. Ah. That's big of them. 
and very recently in 2007 the church made it more clear that limbo was a theory and not an official doctrine of the church, separating the church from that belief. As for the argument the false effect of freeing a child's soul from limbo does not warrant the conclusion of giving your money. It's all Dr. Bennett. I didn't say it. Don't write me any hate mail about it, okay? Whether or not I happen to agree, don't write me any hate mail about it. So the exception here is a belief of an effect could be argued to be an actual effect. But I would say that's a, a flimsy argument. Dr. Bennett, however, goes on to say that effects can be supported empirically or scientifically, but they can also be claimed by faith, making them impossible to prove or disprove. Exactly. Now let's move on to false equivalents. I am certainly hoping that we can make it uh, make it through the F's today, hopefully. And then we can move on to the G's uh, later this week or next, perhaps. When there aren't any spiders here freaking me out. Uh, you guys, I can't. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows my sorrow. Oh, I suffer so much for you. I'm ba I'm, I mean, right? I'm basically, I should be sainted, knighted even. I do apologize for the interruption. I just, you know, tell me what, you know what, tell me what your major fears are and, and think about what would happen if you encountered one of your major fears while you were on the air. You'd probably freak out. Uh, <clears throat> so, False equivalence is our next logical fallacy. Uh, the description, via Dr. Bennett, is an argument or claim in which two completely opposing arguments appear to be logically equivalent when, in fact, they're not logically equivalent. The confusion is often due to one shared characteristic between two or more items of comparison in the argument that is way off in the order of magnitude oversimplified or just that important additional factors have been ignored. The logical form via Dr. Bennett's website and his book, of course. Uh, line one, thing one and thing two both share characteristic A. Therefore, line two, therefore things one and two are equal. So I'm interjecting here and just saying, stating the obvious that Obviously, because thing one and thing two share characteristic A, they're not equal. Um, my cousin and I both have brown, black, or black, brown, however you say it, hair. Uh, does that mean that we're completely genetically equivalent in all their ways? No, not at all. So, yes, it's true that we share that black, brown hair, but... That's all that's true. The conclusion that I'm drawing after that is what's false, and that's what makes it a logical fallacy. So the logical form doesn't work. It's a false equivalence. And example number one is, uh, I think, a really good illustration of that. President, 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 yes, that's the thing. President Patuti, 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 oh, I get it. President Patuti ordered a military strike that killed many civilians. He is no different than any other mass murderer, and he belongs in prison. So the explanation would be, both President Patuti and a mass murderer share the characteristic that something they did, I think he means mass murderer, so I'll read that again, correcting for, I believe, what Dr. Bennett may have meant. Explanation. Both President Batuti and a mass murderer share the characteristic that something they did resulted in the death of civilians. However, the circumstances, the level of responsibility, and the intent are signif excuse me, significantly different for the president than a typical mass murderer. And ignoring these factors is pretty unreasonable. So that's what makes the argument fallacious. You know, this is one 
that to me strikes me as very similar uh, to the Hitler fallacy, but you can listen to, I believe, two shows back in, in the logical fallacy segment, uh, two shows back. You can listen and uh, hear this really interesting um, sort of fallacy that Dr. Bennett has actually named after Hitler because of all the comparisons in modern day that go on to, you know, comparing so-and-so to Hitler. Uh, I, I believe that he's absolutely correct in labeling it its own logical fallacy. And I think this one is very, very similar. False equivalence is very similar. Uh, so, example number two. Using the Second Amendment as justification to allow civilians to own nu nuclear submarines. Pretty self-explanatory. But even if, if it weren't, the explanation would be that in this case, the first thing is the weapon as understood at the time the Second Amendment was passed. The second thing of comparison is the nuclear submarine, also a weapon, but one of significantly different magnitude. This example also introduces the difference between a legal justification and an argumentative one. See, appeal to the law. We did discuss that one, and I believe the first or second episode uh, of the logical fallacies segments that I started doing on a regular basis. Uh, so you can check out the appeal to the law right here on Dominique Does Life. Um, yeah, as we've talked about numerous times, um, please excuse me, I'm having an allergy attack here on top of everything else. <coughs> In addition to um, the, uh, okay, well, where were we? Yeah. Uh, in addition to the false equivalence fallacy, the appeal to the law fallacy is also significant. And I believe that it is really something we need to take a look at because a legal definition versus like a cultural or colloquial definition of something, you know, is, is totally different. Like, those two things are completely different. Defining something legally and then defining, like, a social idea, a social more, a social norm, or a colloquial definition of something are obviously two very different things. Uh, there's another fallacy that we actually discussed a while back as well, where essentially people will revert a word back, a word that's evolved to mean something else back to its original definition, say hundreds of years ago, right? And uh, let's say, I believe the example for that fallacy, this is a few episodes ago here, so forgive me, I don't remember um, what fallacy we were talking about that day, but there is a fallacy where essentially... Um, the example that Dr. Bennett uses is that somebody goes to an art show, they're told their work is awful, and their friend says, well, maybe the art critic meant that it's inspiring of awe. It's inspirational. Because that is what awful used to mean back hundreds of years ago. Unfortunately, today that's not what it means. So we're looking at two different sets of definitions and two different sets of rules. So it's really not appropriate to use like an equivalency, an equivalent standard, let's say, between something that's true legally and something that's true colloquially or socially today, right? So there really are some very important uh, differences there that we need to look at. And yes, it does make your argument fallacious if you conflate those two things. It does. I'm sorry. And I think that we need to keep an eye on that ourselves and make sure that we're keeping abreast of these logical fallacies so that we don't fall into these traps. And the exception to the false equivalence uh, explanations and examples that were given here are basically or is, I should say, there is really only one exception, uh, that like most fallacies, this is one of degree rather than kind. <clears throat> the order of magnitude can be debated. Some may exaggerate this order of magnitude, claiming a fallacy 
where it would be unreasonable to do so. Okay. And fantasy projection is our next fallacy. Okay, let's scroll on down. Folks, I apologize if you're watching on camera right now. Um, I just moved a plant today that has a lot of pollen and my eyes are just burning and itching like crazy. <laughs> so the ongoing saga of me moving the damn plant around that has so much pollen in it and trying to make sure it doesn't blast my pollen allergies out of the stratosphere is ongoing. I will let you know what the conclusion is when it is resolved. Ugh. Between that and the spider and cats and the <laughs> delivery at the restaurant, we are just not running a professional operation today. Ah, uh, what can you do? Sometimes you just gotta roll with it and laugh. So fantasy projection, right? And then we've got, after this, we've got, uh, let's see, two more, um, two more F fallacies to get on with. So fantasy projection is description via Dr. Bennett's website, confusing subjective experiences. So again, subjective experiences like my personal reality, uh, consciousness is subjective. One's own personal observations are obviously subjective. So we're conflating subjective experiences, usually emotionally charged as they can tend to be, with objective realities. What do I always say, you guys? Is that thing that you feel is true in your reality, in your mind, in your heart, actually true in reality? Check yourself. Always check yourself. So, confusing that subjective experience with objective reality and then suggesting or demanding that others accept the fantasy or subjective reality inside of your mind as cold hard fact, as truth. Just, you know, accept it. That's how things are. And of course, that's how a child thinks. We've talked a lot about subject-object relationships. Um, children have that sort of relationship. Well, if it's true inside of me, like I'm closing my eyes, I've got my hand over my eyes, I can't see anyone, that's my subjective reality. So clearly, if I impose my subjective reality onto all of you, because I genuinely, as a child, think that my subjective reality is objective reality, is shared reality, then I'm so confused as to why you can still see me because my hands are covering my eyes. I can't see anything. So why should you be able to see anything, right? It's like playing hide and seek with an infant. So think of it that way. Fantasy projection, playing hide and seek with an infant. And the logical form via Dr. Bennett's website is line one. Person one has subjective experience, X. Line two, person one incorrectly believes that experience X represents reality. I'm going to interject and say line two, person one incorrectly believes that experience X represents shared reality or objective reality. So line three, therefore person one insists that others accept that X represents shared reality. So I hope that made sense. I wanted to kind of slow it down and just explain things very specifically. So person one has a subjective experience. Then they believe that that experience represents reality for everybody. And they insist that others believe whatever their experience was. So uh, example number one via Dr. Bennett. Freddie says, people are mean to me wherever I go. It is clear that we live in a cruel world with nasty people. If you don't see that, something is wrong with you. Well, of course we live in a cruel world with nasty people. We also live in a really beautiful world with amazing people in it. 
there definitely are other realities to consider. So, Freddy is trying to impose his personal reality on everyone else, and he maybe doesn't even realize he's doing it. Which is sort of the hallmark of the fantasy projection fallacy. You don't realize you're doing it. You don't realize it is a fantasy. So that's one of the reasons why it's always so important to check yourself. Do a reality check. Do a sanity check. And one of the things that I do when I'm sort of doing a reality check, a sanity check on myself is I will employ friends, like a trusted friend or colleague, and just say, hey, you know what, can you check this thing that I'm thinking or that I've just said or that I want to write or that I want to publish? Am I stuck in my subjective reality or am I really addressing something that uh, is true in objective reality? And I think the second thing you need to do in addition to checking yourself is be open to hearing the truth. Be open to hearing the truth. Uh, be open to someone else being honest with you. It's always good. It's a good thing. You can you can develop and change and, and grow from there. And that's always a wonderful thing. It's exactly what we're trying to help everyone to do here by discussing these logical fallacies. Uh, so, the explanation of example number one is perhaps people are always mean, always, quote-unquote, mean to Freddy because Freddy is mean to others, and it's Freddy's behavior that's resulting in the mean behaviors of others. This is known as self-fulfilling prophecy. It is, and it's also known as self-sabotage. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, and you may just be sabotaging yourself as well. In fact, you likely are if that's the way you look at the world. We talked about victim mentality and victim archetypes uh, last episode. Please do check that out on Spreaker at Dominique Does Life. So, Dr. Bennett goes on to say that Freddie is projecting his experience, which is unique to him, onto the world at large. He's insisting that other people see humanity the way he does, which isn't fair, and it's really not very mature. It's not very emotionally intelligent. It's not very mature. And it's just not very thoughtful. And it's also just it's fallacious reasoning. Example number two, and I love this. Uh, Harry Potter fans will get this one. We are all surrounded by nargles. They, uh, these are spiritual beings who help us through life. We know they exist because they are the ones that give us the confidence to move forward in a decision. The explanation. Oh, shout out to Luna Lovegood. Ign explanation. Ignoring the circular reasoning how we quote-unquote know Nargles exist, one person's fantasy might be their own reality, but not everybody else's. So it's your fantasy, it's your reality, and it's not true in everyone else's reality, however. The tip here is when you make uh, a bad decision, that's due to Kerplunkers. <laughs> you know. That other made-up creature, Kerplunkers. So, uh, far-fetched hypotheses. Let's move on to far-fetched hypotheses. Uh, the description here is offering a bizarre or far-fetched hypothesis as the correct explanation without first ruling out more mundane explanations. Now, again, this is something we've discussed before. Occam's razor is a really great and really important tool in, uh, in discerning fact from fiction. Uh, never ascribe to malice what can be ascribed to simple ignorance or laziness, right? So... There are a lot of conspiracy theories out there who use that far-fetched hypothesis, and I, I feel like it. there's a reason for it, and I think part of that reason is that it fulfills someone's need to feel important, or it fulfills or supports or backs up someone's worldview, uh, backs up someone's internal narrative, right? Their own subjective reality that they've created, 
based on their experiences and the feelings and thoughts that they have about him. So these far-fetched hypotheses, these conspiracy theories about yourself, about others, about the world around you are very attractive. And that's why we've got to be so careful of them because they're not based in reality, they're not helpful, and they're not true. So far, fetched hypotheses. Uh, the description via Dr. Bennett at uh, logicallyfallacious.com is offering a bizarre, again, far-fetched hypothesis, figured we'd go over that one more time, is the correct explanation without first ruling out more mundane explanations. Again, Occam's razor is the tool to do that. So what did I just say? Never ascribe to malice that which can be ascribed to ignorance or laziness. It's very simple. Now, sometimes we might like to think that everyone or one particular person or group of people around us is or are horrible people or out to get us or delusional or evil or whatever. But is that... The most likely scenario, the most likely hypothesis, the most likely reason for them doing things? Are they really out to get us? Are they really evil? Are they really this, that, and the other? Or could they just be ignorant or lazy or inconsiderate? It's probably likely that they are one of those three things rather than evil or malicious or out to get us, right? Um, it's easy to get stuck on our, on our own fantasies, on our own subjective realities. And it's not so easy to use that Occam's razor, that tool, to cut through what, you know, what we shouldn't be considering, right? It's, it's harder to look at reality head on and say, well, okay, I know that this narrative that I've invented or that I believe to be true genuinely sort of uh, fits a certain worldview or personal narrative that I have, but really I need to look at it. Is it objectively likely to be true? And nine times out of ten, it's not. So, the first, <clears throat> the first example via Dr. Bennett, Dr. Bennett's website, logicallyfallacious.com, is uh, Seth and Terrence having a discussion. Seth says, "Yeah." Seth says, "There's a guy who has like OCD or something who owns a Mercedes Benz. He parks it across the street." I don't know, a few times a week, and he, like, sets off his alarm, and it has to go exactly five times each time he gets in and out of his car. That's what, that's what Seth said. No, I apologize, guys. You probably hear that a lot. It's literally one guy. It's literally one guy. I guess he drives a car that's fancy because it has an alarm on it. Congratulations. Let's try that again. Example number one, Seth says, how did my keys get in your coat pocket? Terrence says, honestly, I don't know, but I have a theory. Last night, a unicorn was walking through the neighborhood. The local leprechauns did not like this intrusion, so they dispatched the fairies to make the unicorn go away. The fairies took your keys and dropped them on the unicorn. Okay, then the unicorn got scared and ran off and went back from where he came. Then the fairies returned your keys, but then they accidentally put them in the wrong pocket, ended up putting them in my pocket instead. Whoops, darn fairies. So, okay, that's Terrence's explanation, but is that the most likely explanation in reality? Probably not. Yes, there are infinite possibilities, but as Dr. Bennett says, there are far fewer probabilities. Again, uh, that person that you work with could be me being mean and awful to you because they have a horrible grudge against you, they hate you, and they're evil. Or it could be that they're having a tough time, that they didn't even notice they were acting that way. Or, again, that it's 
just either ignorance, they don't know that they're acting that way or that you feel that way about them, or laziness. They just haven't made the effort to to work with you or get to know you. It's probably not that they're evil and they have it out for you, right? So I'm not going to do the other ex uh, examples and explanations here. I think we've really quite well and truly covered things. Um, the exception, however, is if mundane explanations can be ruled out first, which usually they can't, by the way, usually through falsification, like the i.e. the scientific method, then we can <clears throat> move on to more bizarre hypotheses. But again, not until we've ruled everything else out. And we don't decide, just my tip, we don't decide upon conclusions first and then pick and choose what facts we want to uh, consider based on whether or not they support the conclusion that we've already picked. That's logically fallacious as well. Let's move on to the final logical fallacy of the night uh, in the F category, which is faulty comparison also known as bad comparison, false comparison, inconsistent comparison. It's a form of inconsistent comparison. And the description being comparing one thing to another that, are, that isn't related. I, I think that that was worded poorly, but I would say comparing one thing to another thing that's unrelated. In order to make one thing look more or less desirable than it really is. Example number one. <clears throat> Broccoli has significantly less fat than the leading candy bar. So you can replace all of your Snickers bars with broccoli and enjoy the broccoli just as much as you would a Snickers bar because, hello, less fat. Uh, explanation there would be while both broccoli and candy bars can be considered snacks, comparing the two in terms of fat content and ignoring the significant <clears throat> difference in taste leads to this being a false comparison. Example number two via Dr. Bennett's website is religion may have been wrong about a few things, but since science has been wrong about so many more things, religion's what's right. Religion has it right. It's correct. Science is just dead wrong about everything. Dr. Bennett's explanation here is we are comparing a method of knowledge, science, and by the way, science is used to rule things out. That's what the scientific method is. So we're comparing a method of knowledge, which is science, to a system of belief, which is faith. And faith is not known for re uh, revising itself, rather, based on new evidence. Science is. Good point, Dr. Bennett. I concede that for sure. And even when it does the quote-unquote wrongs are blamed on human interpretation. So let's say, <clears throat> let's say the church revises its stance on something. It's not because new information has come out. It's because people have misinterpreted this thing. Well, we're going to stop misinterpreting it, and then we'll be correct. Science is all about improving ideas to get closer to the truth, and in some cases, completely throwing out theories <clears throat> excuse me, that have been proven wrong. And that really is the purpose of science. Science is literally here to disprove things until we are left with the truth, the only possible truth, and to continue, even so, trying to disprove and debunk that truth. That's what science is about. Science seeks to disprove. Pseudoscience seeks to prove it's that simple. So, <clears throat> furthermore, says Dr. Bennett, the claims of religion are virtually all unfalsifiable. It's another fallacy. And thus cannot be proven wrong. Therefore, comparing religion and science on the basis of falsifiability is a false, faulty, falsy, faulty comparison. So, he says, again, therefore, comparing religion and science on the basis of falsifiability is a faulty comparison. One can argue, however, as an exception, what exactly is really not related. And the tip via Dr. Bennett is comparisons of any kind almost 
always tend to be flawed. So think carefully before you accept any kind of a comparison as evidence. I would say that not only are they flawed, but oftentimes they're just truly designed. Like people sort of use this fallacy on purpose, faulty comparison. Because <clears throat> comparisons uh, that people give you so that you'll pick one thing or another uh, are designed to make you only select one thing. Like, if you're giving a comparison with, between thing X and thing Y by somebody who's purposely utilizing faulty comparison as a logical fallacy and hoping you won't notice, everything you will notice that everything in their argument will be slanted toward thing X. So it's obvious if you really use your critical thinking skills and your logical reasoning skills when this fallacy is at play. Uh, folks, my voice is about ready to quit, and uh, so I think we're going to sign off for the night. We'll be back uh, this week, I'm not sure when, with the G's in Logical Fallacies, LogicallyFallacious.com, Dr. Bo Bennett, and hopefully we'll be back on a day where I'm not having horrible allergies and I'm not seated next to a bunch of pollen. Um, <clears throat> so thank you so much for tuning in and please feel free to like and share. I think that despite the horrible allergy attack and then the attack of that awful spider, we've actually had some good uh, information covered here and had a good discussion. So I thank you for joining me for that. I appreciate each and every one of you. And you know what? Take care and be well. I'm going ahead and signing off. <laughs>